I want to now introduce our speaker, Ruth Ann Viznoskis, who is our Commissioner of Housing Development and Preservation. And uh, she's, going, she's had this office since September, but she's worked in the, uh, the uh, office for seven years. So she knows the issues, and I know you want to hear what she has to say about affordable housing. Ruth Ann? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ruth Ann Visnauskas. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development here in New York City. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm, I'm gratified that people are interested in the work that HPD does. Um, I just want to start by thanking the League uh, for their commitment uh, and activism going back to 1920. You've made a difference in so many ways. Um, the right to vote is, often too, is too often taken for granted. Um, and we, the League's work in promoting uh, the critical importance of every voice in a strong democracy and your policy priorities um, on the environment, on gun safety, on voting rights, um, campaign finance reform are really essential um, to 21st century America. So um, I'd like to ask for your consideration uh, with regard to the federal budget, uh, which is certainly the area where I think we uh, heavily align, um, <clears throat> um, and the ways that that impacts uh, local New Yorkers. So let me dive in. I have a, a long, uh, not too long, but I have sort of some brief um, remarks that have a lot of information in them. And afterwards, I'm happy to take some um, Q&A to clarify anything or if, if, if anything is of interest to folks. Um, so really our name, Housing Preservation and Development, says it all. <clears throat> we both preserve and develop housing. HPD is, an, is the nation's largest municipal housing agency, and we play a unique um, and important role. Um, in New York City, 70% of the population rents their home, uh, which is uh, different from the rest of the country, where 30% um, of the country is renters. And so HPD's overriding responsibility is to ensure the safety and the quality of New York City's rental housing. <clears throat> Our work ranges from enforcing the city's housing maintenance code, uh, which is preventing the deterioration of privately owned multifamily properties, uh, protecting the rights of tenants, managing the nation's fifth largest Section 8 program, uh, overseeing the management of the property in our portfolio. So historically, HPD has developed a couple hundred thousand units, uh, which we um, have asset management responsibility for. And we preserve and develop affordable housing. Over the years, uh, New York City has faced enormous challenges. There was wholesale abandonment of neighborhoods and precipitous drops in population, followed by spurts of market-driven resurgence and growth. And no matter what, HPD has always provided practical and workable solutions that result in housing programs that expand um, and improve the city's irreplaceable multifamily housing stock. We also seek to protect tenants, and we have the most comprehensive and aggressive housing code, enforce housing code enforcement operation in the whole country. Our success as an agency depends on teamwork and on creating strong, dynamic partnerships with individuals and groups across the spectrum of interests in New York City. For-profit developers, not-for-profit organizations, and property owners, the financial sector, elected officials, tenant groups, trade organizations, our sister agencies on the city, state, and federal level, and advocates who are as passionate about housing as we are. Under the most recent citywide plan, the New Housing Marketplace Plan, HPD and our partners finance the preservation and new construction of 160,000 affordable rent-stabilized units. That's 24,000 more housing units than in the 2010 federal census in all of Albany County and upstate New York. And when we reach our goal of 165,000 units in the spring, we'll be able to say that we financed enough housing for half a million people and we've leveraged non-city investment of more than $23 billion. So with that, I'd like to take some time this morning to <clears throat> engage in some forward thinking and to talk through some of the challenges and opportunities in affordable housing in the years to come. First, on the development side, our priority is to complete the new housing marketplace plan. Um, some folks may have heard of it, um, not at all, and some may have heard about it uh, uh, quite a bit, depending on uh, your involvement in the housing sector, but a couple of statistics. Uh, by the time we wrap up the plan, uh, we will have invested more than $27 billion in rebuilding and revitalizing neighborhoods across the five boroughs. We will have contributed 150,000 construction-related jobs to the city, 
and the 165,000 housing units is enough to put a roof over the heads of every resident of the city of Atlanta. So it's not a small plan. It's very large and very significant. And though we're, we are uh, nearing the end of it and looking forward um, to what the new administration um, has in store, I think it's important just to sort of talk a little bit about what the previous plan accomplished. So uh, to break down the numbers a little, here are some borough level statistics. <clears throat> in Manhattan, we invested about $8.3 billion and created about 51,000 units. In the Bronx, we invested about $7.6 billion in also around 50,000 units. In Brooklyn, we invested $5.3 billion in about 37,000 units. And in Queens, we invested about 2.2 billion in 16,500 units. And last but not least, in Staten Island, uh, we invested about 336 million in about 2,500 units. So, it's sort of easy to get caught up in the big numbers, um, and there certainly are plenty of them, but I don't want to forget uh, why it's important. So it's not simply sort of a target or checking a box to get to a, a housing goal. What we do really drives a positive impact in the lives of everyday New Yorkers. Affordable housing provides critical <coughs> housing to people that brings stability, it brings peace of mind, and it brings an opportunity to break free from rent burden. Many families have to make difficult choices. Uh, do you pay for rent? Do you take your kid to the doctor? Do you pay for rent or do you get a prescription filled? Do you pay for rent or do you buy healthy food? These are some awful choices that rent burden families have to make and they diminish for families who have access to affordable housing and that's our goal. Here are the numbers, some numbers I'm most proud of. So 80% of all of our units serve low income households that earn between 40 and 80% of the area median income. This is a group that's by far the highest rent burden of all they earn slightly too much to qualify for other government subsidies, but they earn far too little to pay for market rent. So affordable housing is a critical resource for households in this range, and we are so happy that over 80% of the housing that we've built serves exactly that demographic. We've also financed about 5,500 units of supportive housing, which provides safe homes and supportive services for the city's most vulnerable populations. Um, and in 2012, we made a commitment to double our production of supportive housing. We had previously been doing about 500 units a year. And starting in 2012, we're now doing 1,000 units a year of supportive housing. Um, and with the help of um, so many people and with our partnership with the state, we've made that goal a reality in 2012. And we're on track to do it again uh, in our fiscal year that will end in June. Um, moving on to Mitchell Lama. To date, we've preserved about 107,000 units in a variety of multifamily buildings. 107,000, 107, which if I said it correctly. Um, and within that, there are 30,000 units of Mitchell Lama housing. Some of these were originally in affordable uh, housing programs and they reached the end of their regulatory agreements. Other buildings were financially over leveraged. Um, low income properties who owners, where ownership allowed them to fall into disrepair, creating hazardous and unhealthy living situation for the tenants. Um, so preserving the city's Mitchell Lama stock is, um, may not be as sort of glamorous as some of the new construction projects that we end up in the press for, but it's no less important. It's really a critical housing stock for low income New Yorkers. <clears throat> By and large, the Mitchell Lama buildings were built uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s as middle income housing, uh, and many of the original tenants are on fixed incomes and aging in place. So it's a critical resource, and we're proud to have preserved so many. And though the plan is often thought of as just in units, there's so much more being done at HPD. Uh, we continue to protect the rights of tenants and to combat distressed properties through the tireless work of our code enforcement operation. Our Division of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services plays a critical role. We have housing inspectors out on the street 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in all weather, on the weekends, on the holidays, making sure that the city's housing stock is maintained. Last year alone, the code staff performed 915,000 inspections in the city's multifamily buildings. We issued about 386,000 violations and we closed another 434,000 violations upon reinspection, meaning that the conditions that we found when we went out initially were corrected, either by the landlord or where HPD stepped in, and we're extremely proud of those figures. We have attorneys in our housing litigation division. They filed nearly 12,000 cases in housing court and are committed to using the full extent of the law to protect tenants. They've even tried cases that have landed negligent landlords in jail. We have initiatives like the Proactive Preservation Initiative, which uses code enforcement as well as financing tools and our strong asset management to ensure stability in at-risk multifamily properties across the city. 
Our alternative enforcement program, which some people may have heard of, targets the 200 most distressed buildings in the city every year. The city holds owners accountable for bringing them, accountable for bringing them into good repair. To date, a total of 1,200 buildings have come in AEP, so we've done 200 a year for the last six years, and we've discharged 762 of them, meaning that either the owners or the city brought the buildings back into good repair and corrected the majority of the violations. So that's thousands of New Yorkers who are now in safe, clean, and stable places to call home. And while we continue our day-to-day -day work to create and preserve affordable housing, last year we faced a new challenge that had a significant impact on many neighborhoods throughout New York City. Superstorm Sandy, as many of you um, were sure survived and lived through, uh, landed in October 2012. But the majority of the recovery was really a 2013 process. And I'm proud to say that HPD uh, continues to be a big part of that. Under the city's Build It Back initiative, we're spearheading two important programs. We are doing the rebuilding of one to four family homes uh, that were completely destroyed by the storm. And we are also uh, providing funding to multifamily landlords who had to make much needed repairs to critical building systems um, in the aftermath of the storm and who are also looking to implement resiliency measures into their buildings now. We've already begun to close our loans uh, earlier uh, this, uh, not this year, uh, earlier in 2013. Uh, we closed a loan for Knickerbocker Village, which is a state supervised uh, affordable housing development on the Lower East Side. Uh, Knickerbocker and two other properties in the Rockaways uh, received uh, a total of two and a half million dollars in CDBGDR, which is the name of the, of the federal funds that we received for Sandy, to make repairs and upgrades to improve the resiliency and to help mitigate uh, future storm events. We're also working closely with our partners to rebuild the homes uh, that were destroyed. There were 662 homeowners that have registered as having their homes destroyed as a result of the storm. Uh, the, the process is an ongoing one and is complicated, but we hope to begin rebuilding those, those homes uh, early this year. And Sandy provides a good jumping off point to look at our future of the industry and some of the challenges we're facing. Over the last few years, we faced heavy budget cuts. We've always responded by finding creative ways to do more with less, but the severe federal budget cuts have hit some of our most important subsidy sources. Over the last few years, Congress has cut funding to vital programs such as the HOME program, which we were cut $67 million over the last four years, and the Community Development Block Grant Program, CDBG, which we were cut $39 million over the last four years. This is all funding that we use to finance the construction and preservation of affordable housing, and that we use to fund our enforcement staff that maintains the city's multifamily housing stock. Most recently, the federal sequester imposed budget cuts that hurt our most vulnerable citizens by placing fiscal constraints on our Section 8 program. I know the League of Women Voters has a number of top policy priorities, such as gun safety and the environment, that consume much of your attention. But I also want to thank you for the League's attention and advocacy on the federal budget and the repeal of sequestration. Federal funding makes up 85% of HPD's budget, 85%, particularly through Section 8 rental assistance, home, and the CDBG program. Federal funding decisions directly impact our ability to create new affordable housing, to revitalize our communities, and to ensure that our existing housing stock and families who live in it remain safe. I cannot overstate the importance of federal HUD funding. And so while I thank you for your work to date, I also ask that you join us in a partner in calling on Congress to repeal the sequester and to provide increased funding for 2014 and going forward. Despite Congress's recently, recently reaching a budget deal, last year's sequester devastated our Section 8 budget, reducing it by approximately $35 million, with only six months to absorb that cut. Even after spending down our existing reserves, we still have a significant deficit, and we're put in a position of trying to do more with less. Because of the cuts, we're asking our voucher holders to make some sacrifices in the hope that no family will be forced to go without a voucher. We took immediate steps to avoid the risk of terminating families from the program by asking some clients to relocate to smaller and less costly apartments, or if they did not want to relocate, to stay in apartments but to pay a larger share of their rent. Instituting these measures to reduce the subsidy and make the vouchers less expensive has enabled us to stretch our remaining Section 8 funding as far as possible. Pulling vouchers away from the families is a step that we are resolute in preventing. Had we not spent down our reserves and instituted these measures, the cuts to our Section 8 budget would have required us to terminate approximately 2,900 vouchers. We'll know more about exactly how much funding we're going to get for these programs soon, um, but 
even with the recent deal um, that the that Congress has made, the funding is unlikely to significantly improve, and we feel that the risk of the terminations remains. The sequester has had another effect on affordable housing. It's created a production, a barrier to the production of senior housing. A few years, Congress zeroed out the budget line for the HUD 202 program, which was our major source of funding to produce senior housing. And in the absence of 202, we then used Section 8 to produce senior housing. The sequester has all but sort of ended that effort. And so without 202 and with Section 8 severely impacted, we are now limited in our ability to produce senior housing a critical source of housing for our most vulnerable population. So this has made us only more determined to do everything we can to keep our most vulnerable citizens housed in the face of crippling budget cuts. We've met with our elected officials on the city, state, and federal level. We've been to Washington to make our case directly to the members of Congress, but we can't do it alone. These cuts may affect some of you. They certainly affect vulnerable people in your neighborhoods, and they really have an impact on our ability to revitalize important neighborhoods in the city. We believe it's within Congress's discretion to remedy this and to bring relief to New Yorkers, but also to those facing this issue across the country. And we will continue to work closely with you and all of our partners to try and address this. The demand for affordable housing is not going away, and we should not shy away from having lofty goals and aspirations or from setting new targets. So going forward, we are hoping to have a new housing plan that builds on those successes while taking into account are the current challenges we have at the federal budget level. The strategies that we'll use going forward will likely include new tax incentive programs that continue to produce new, and, new construction and preservation of affordable housing. Um, and on the new construction front, I think we'll see a greater focus on neighborhoods. Um, there's already been a lot of talk about an inc expanded inclusionary program, and we think there'll be a continued effort there, as well as to working with other city agencies to find vacant land throughout the city to build new housing. To date, we've had a very successful collaboration with NYCHA, and we've produced over 4,000 units on underutilized uh, NYCHA land. So we'll continue to work with our partners and other agencies. We'll continue to work with our partners to fight for federal funds. Um, and lastly, I guess I would say that I think one of the great lessons that we've learned um, over the past years, and one which will guide us forward, is that we really have a tremendous um, affordable housing uh, advocacy and production industry here in New York City. Um, it's an industry that's responded to challenges time and time again, and I think we'll continue to do that. Um, and I think we will take all of the programmatic and the financing and the development experience that we've had over the last 12 years in producing the 160,000 unit new housing marketplace plan, and we will just build on that, and we will build smarter, and we'll be more strategic about the neighborhoods that we invest in and the communities that we build. Just to sort of recap from where I started, it's sort of an incredible thing to, to, to note that we've invested more than $27 billion all in in rebuilding and revitalizing neighbors across the five boroughs. It's really changed the city for the better. There's still a lot to do, and we can't do it alone, and we look forward to working with you together on this. Thank you so much. And I know I covered a very wide uh, range of topics, so I'm happy to take questions. So overall, the plan was about 70-30, so it was about 70% preservation and about 30% new construction. Oh, sure, sorry, the question was, of the uh, 160,000 units that we've done today, what was the split of preservation versus new construction? And it's about 70% preservation and about 30% new construction. And, and netting out the net gain, if you consider that something is going to market rate, as mm -hmm. they inevitably do, what would the number be? Um, I don't have a number, I don't have a statistic on how many units um, you mean that were previously affordable became market rate. Um, yeah, I don't know that we have that, but um, you know, certainly um, I think the biggest impact on that would be the rent stabilization, um, rent limits and the sort of the, the guidelines around units coming out of rent stabilization, depending on what you define as affordable versus non-affordable. Um, but I think that probably in the city is maybe what people would see as the metric for um, something coming out of rent stave and into market. Otherwise, I think it's a little hard to sort of, you have to kind of define, I guess, what you think is affordable and now not affordable, but it's a, it's a good question. Yeah? Um, my name is Carolyn Green. I live in the Bronx. I would like to know, what's the difference, or do they work together, um, 
the inspectors from housing preservation mm -hmm. and code enforcement. <coughs> um, does one um, organization have a, have a higher override or, or have a, so, a, a say so in, in terms of um, maintaining an apartment? That's what I would like to know. Sure. Oh, so, do you have any cards? Um, I might. I'll look. Oh. Um, I'm easy to find, if not. Um, <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, what's the difference between uh, sort of HPD inspectors and housing code inspectors? Yes, yes, yes. So um, they're sort of the same thing. So, so, okay, so they work together. So yeah, so the Department of Housing Preservation and Development is sort of our umbrella um, name. And within that, we have several different divisions. And we have a division of, uh, we have an, an office, it's called of, of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. And that's where our code operation lives. So all our code inspectors uh, report in that division of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. So we just have one sort of division that is the okay. inspector or division. That's what I really want to understand okay. because <laughs> how the preservation inspectors uh -huh. come to your apartment to see your um, Oh, to see what what needs to be repaired. Mm -hmm. Now, code three one one. That's code enforcement, right? Uh, no, that would be the same code that inspectors. Would be the same one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the the <coughs> third avenue in the Bronx, Arthur Avenue, is the same thing. The 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 code office. Yes. Yeah, right. So that's an HPD office. It's just in the Bronx. Okay, where so the reason why I'm asking is because there's a situation in the Bronx where the inspectors from housing preservation have come and said one thing. We want one send their inspectors and they said another. How do we know who's more important or from the other? And who should we listen to? So they should be the same inspectors because we're only one agency, but we can maybe talk afterwards and I can help okay. better understand. Okay. Oh, it could be the buildings department, yeah. And we, but we can talk afterwards oh, okay. for sure. Yes? The previous administration has done, you know, has been responsible for this essentially. Uh, what do you see going forward with this administration? I think that they will, um, I think one of the great things that has come out of the last administration is that we uh, went through a lot of cycles. We, um, you know, we suffered through the financial crisis and so had to respond. Uh, we saw a lot of buildings being over leveraged um, a couple of years ago and we responded to that. And so I think the affordable housing industry in New York City is kind of like no other and it's a pretty incredible and strong industry. I don't think there's any other city um, that has this level of investment going into affordable housing. So I think the greatest thing that's come out of the of the plan is that we have an industry that's ready to respond to what the next plan should be. And I think that the next plan will be um, sort of on the heels of the uh, previous one will be a, a, a more of a focus on neighborhoods and really making sure that um, following sort of an equality agenda that the poorest neighborhoods are really getting um, the investment that they need um, in housing as well as in other services. So I think we'll see sort of more of a neighborhood focus uh, in a lot of the housing things that we do. May I just say one thing more? Mm -hmm. This is not a question, but a comment that in the in the place Stay that louder. I live, there are people that are living there for 30, 40, 50 years, and and uh, the powers that be, you know, the consortium is trying so hard to get these people who have been there for so long out. Mm -hmm. And and uh, does the city make any kind of, of provision? to find housing for these kind of people. So we certainly spend a lot of time making sure tenants are protected in place. So we um, we have a housing litigation division, um, and I think in, in my remarks I mentioned that we filed 12,000 um, housing litigation cases last year to make sure that people are not harassed out of their apartments, to make sure that they're not getting services cut off as an effort to get them out of their apartments. The, very successful. We have an amazing housing litigation team, and we encourage people when they have issues to call. If they call 311 or they can call HPD or they can call any sort of legal services or advocacy agency, and they will get looped in um, with us, or we can link them in with a legal services type provider. We certainly uh, spend an enormous amount of resources um, making sure the tenants in place are protected. Yes. You um, gave a lot of um, statistics before, but you gave percentages and not actual numbers. Mm -hmm. And I'm really bad with percentages in terms of the numbers. So I'm wondering if you can give us some numbers. You talked about 40 to, to 80 percent. Um, and then you also talked about, I, I'm curious to know what the level of affordable is. What do you call it? What are the parameters? And what is the income in relation to the affordable numbers? Yeah. Because those numbers seem to be 
out there somewhere, and I've never gotten too many good answers. Sure. Um, so let me just answer that. And I'll give you sort of broad answers because I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but the area median income um, in the city is about $86,000 uh, for a family of four. Um, our housing, the numbers that I gave you was we serve people who make up between, predominantly we serve people who make between 40 and 80% of AMI, which was the percentage that you, you um, are questioning. Um, so what that translates to is for a family of four, that's roughly between depending sort of on the apartment size and the family makeup, um, it would be a family earning between roughly 40,000 to maybe 65,000. Um, uh, and for a single, it would be someone earning as low as maybe $20,000 to about $30,000. Now that's sort of where the majority of our housing um, um, serves. Now we certainly serve people lower on the spectrum and we serve people higher on the spectrum as well. Um, um, that's just sort of the majority of it is. So it's a, you know, a, a, a sing, as I said, sort of a single person making in the 20,000, 30,000, and a family, sort of, in, a family of four um, earning maybe between 40 and 60,000. So people who really make too much to qualify for a lot of other government benefits that you might get at the very poor end of the spectrum, like NYCHA, um, or like, you know, food supplements or things like that, but they make clearly not nearly enough um, to pay market rents. So, um, um, you know, it's a really sort of critical, a critical sort of income range. So you're saying twenty to thirty thousand for a, a single, single. Uh, for a single. That's their uh, their income. That's their they, they make more than thirty thousand. They don't qualify for affordable housing. No, no, they would. I'm just saying that's sort of like the with the uh, and I can follow up and give you sort of really specific um, income ranges and sort of give you sort of a rough idea. That's kind of the the types of dollars that I'm talking about. Right. And and in terms of um, the prices and the income um, limits. It's, it's very confusing, I think, and I, I would wonder if, if there's a way to find it out or yeah. if there's something that you can offer us. It is confusing. Um, it, we operate under a lot of um, federal regulations that mandate both, um, you know, the, there's an AMI, so the area median income we get from the federal government, then there's sort of certain percentages uh, against that, which at another layer. Depending on your housing size, there's sort of a multiple of that number, depending on if you're a one-person or a seven-person family. Um, so it's very confusing. We have uh, charts on our website that explain sort of what the AMI is, and they explain sort of what the rent is that is attached to that. I can um, follow up with you after, and we can sort of show you, sort of tell you where on our website you can find um, clearer information. I guess one point I would say is that all of our um, rents are um, set at 30% of income for the income range that we're serving. So that's what we, um, you know, sort of the federal standard and, and has been adopted sort of citywide as an affordability standard that 30%, 30, even up to 40% is the most that a household would pay for their rent before being sort of deemed rent burdened. And if you're paying 40, 50, 60% of your income on rent, you're heavily rent burdened. Um, so 30 is the sort of federal, 30 to 40 is the federal standard uh, for how much of your income you would spend on rent. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I uh, actually live in a rent-stabilized apartment, and uh, I, I don't quite understand the uh, relationship between HPD mm -hmm. and HCR. Okay. And so I think one city, one state, but Correct. in a rent-stabilized apartment, mm -hmm. I've never been able to get any information or traction with HPD, right. I always get sent to HCR. So Correct. what tenants are you protecting? So, <laughs> Because I'd like to know what that number is. Sure. So uh, the question is about the city and the state agencies. So HPD is the city housing agency, and HCR, which stands for Homes and Community Renewal, is the state housing agency. And they have several um, uh, sort of different agencies under their umbrella, which serve different um, purposes. Uh, the state. Um, is in, in responsible for rent stabilization for the city of New York. It's not, um, uh, it's not a city, um, I'm gonna try to say it right, but it's sort of, it's not a city run program, it's a state regulated program. So any question anyone has about rent stay, about the rent, about the increases in any given year, all have to go to HCR. Um, so what, what HPD does, which is different from what, we, what HCR does, um, is I, I would bucket into, um, we do sort of three, we do a lot of things, but I would say we do three primary things. 
we have a large um, financial, we have a large development program, which means that we're providing low interest loans to primarily owners um, or to developers to build multifamily rental housing in the city. So that's kind of our one chunky thing we do. Uh, we also have this um, code operation. So every time someone calls 311 with a complaint about uh, no heat, no hot water, rats, mold, bed bugs, lead, I mean, the, you know, um, they call 311 and that call gets routed to an HP inspector who then will go out to the apartment and check the condition, write a violation if it exists, try to get the landlord to correct if in fact the landlord doesn't correct and it's a hazardous condition, HPD steps in. So that's sort of the code enforcement. It's really on phys the physical housing stock, not on the rent. Um, and the third thing that HP do P HPD does, which I sort of mentioned, not relevant to your question, but just sort of relevant to my remarks and sort of our agency is we run a Section 8 program, so we provide Section 8 vouchers. So those are sort of our main sort of umbrella things, three sort of areas we do under our umbrella, um, managing rent stabe and rent stabilized leases and um, annual increases and anything related to tenant protections provided by rent stabe is all managed by the state. So to this lady's question right here about what was the housing inventory loss, mm -hmm. apartments deregulated mm -hmm. out of rent stabilization? In the last year. So I don't have that handy, but we do have that as an agency. We have that data and I can certainly, we can certainly follow up and provide that, yeah. 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 Hi. Um, my name is Una Adams, and I'm with the Laborers Union. Um, there was a recent bill passed in 730, which required a lot of transparency um, around what was being built, how it was being built, and what the pipeline was. And I was just curious. I, I've noticed not a lot of that stuff has been implemented, and so I was wondering if you could talk about the timeline for implementation of transparency for your agency. Yeah, of course. So we were required by the uh, local law um, to produce information on everything we do, um, sort of the um, name of the person we are lending to, sort of the uh, legal structure of that, of that, um, of the, of, you know, we probably aren't lending to people, we're lending into entities. So the legal structure, um, the contractor, um, the amount we, um, we're lending and probably 17 other pieces of information. Uh, the, the rent for the apartments um, uh, that we were pro that we were producing, what AMI they were serving. So you know, a, a, a long list of information. We are required to um, have it produced as of January 1, 2014. So we are at the sort of tail end of. We don't have really a neat way to pull all that information um, into one kind of handy document. Um, so we are sort of at the tail end of collecting all that, and I think it is expected to be on our website by the end of this month. Yeah. When our mayor was public advocate, he <coughs> put out a list of the 50 worst and neighborhoods in the city. Mm -hmm. When did your department take over a building? When did the city, so, when did it end up for the landlord to disobey the law? So the question was that the public advocate put out a list of the 50 worst buildings in the city, um, the current uh, mayor when he was public advocate, and um, when does HPD take over buildings. So we worked really closely with the public advocate's office on those buildings. It was a major focus for us too. We had our own initiative where we were looking, uh, taking several data sources and looking at buildings that were in distress physically and financially or buildings that were trending towards um, being in distress to try and get to them a little earlier before they were too far gone. Um, HPD doesn't generally take over buildings, but we do a couple of things. One, we will send in code and we will send in code inspectors to write violations and to verify the conditions. We also can step in. Uh, we have an emergency repair program, so we can step in and make repairs in buildings where an owner is not doing it. We also have this program I mentioned called the um, Alternative Enforcement Program. So every year we publish a list um, of the 200 worst buildings in the city, worst being um, code violations, and. Um, we have the uh, legal ability to go in and rather than just correct a violation, we can look at an underlying condition and correct an underlying condition, which is expensive, and we would then lien the property to make sure that we get um, paid back by that. So we have a lot of tools um, in our sort of toolbox to address those types of buildings. Um, <laughs> we have time for only two more questions, okay. your aide tells us. Okay. Um, and I know that the chair of our committee on affordable housing very much wants to ask a question. So, Carol, do you want to just uh, give your question and then we'll take one more after that? Thanks. We are, uh, as a committee of, of the League of Women Voters of New York City, are particularly focused on city funds and what we can get from the city council and the city budget. So, is there bonding? You know, is, are there bonds, city bonds that can be used? 
can we earmark, you know, or, or um, advocate in the budget for subsidies um, for the advantage programs so that, uh, to prevent evictions? What are some of the things that um, we can do at the city level? Uh, that's a great question. I, I guess I'll, uh, to, to pick on sort of one thing that you said, um, which I think is interesting, is the Advantage program. So as people probably read um, in the paper at the time, the city and the state had a joint program that was providing uh, rental assistance to homeless families and working homeless families. Um, and a couple of years ago, the state pulled their portion of the funding, and then the city then cut their portion. And it um, um, was... Um, very difficult for people to lose that housing subsidy. Um, it's been very hard to replace it. It was an expensive program. Um, but I think that, uh, as people know, the shelters are very full today, both the family shelters and the single shelters, and advocating for um, some sort of city-based rental assistance program is certainly a great um, platform and a great idea. Uh, we aren't getting a lot of help from the feds, as I probably said far too many times in my remarks that the Section 8 budget, um, you know, has really been decimated and um, we are trying our best to not terminate people off the program when we would much rather be working to try to expand it. Um, so I think any sort of initiatives and advocacy you can do at the city level um, for a city-based rental assistance program uh, would certainly um, uh, be a great place to start, um, for sure. Excuse me, ma'am, but I thought I heard you ask her was the po about the possibility of the city selling bonds. Yes. Could you address that, ma'am, about this, if, if it's possible for the city to sell bonds to gain funding sure. or advantage or whatever? I thought I heard you ask that. Thank you. Sure. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I can give you the best answer on that piece, but g generally the city um, issues bonds for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for um, capital construction. So construction of things, right? So the city issues uh, lots of bonds all the time for um, streets and for sewers and for the water tunnel, and they issue bonds to fund our budget, and we use that money to build housing and preserve housing. Um, I don't know that they can issue bonds for a rental subsidy, just in terms of the way the bonding rules work. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer. I don't know the I don't know the answer to the question as to whether they can issue bonds to fund that. But certainly to to fund a rental subsidy program, I'm not, I'm not sure that. So that's how we're funded. So the so we we have about um, two hundred million dollars a year of city capital funding in our budget, which is what we use uh, to make loans to develop. We make low cost loans to developers to build and preserve housing. So our development budget is um, is funded by bonds issued by the city and it's also funded by the federal government, by CDBG and by home. Obviously those programs have been cut. We still haven't been cut, you know, in the last couple of years from the from the city budget, uh, which is great. And I think we look forward to the city, you know, we, we, we hope to keep our budget the same or to grow and, and, and issue the bonds is, the, is one of the primary sources for that. Uh, yes, there's three questions. Can I take three really short, quick questions? Can I take one and a half? I'll go. So, uh, well, I'll go with you in the back because I answered a lot of questions in the front. Thanks very much. I heard you mention Mitchell Lama. Uh -huh. Could you could you briefly explain uh, what is Mitchell Lama Housing? And you did make reference to the agency's efforts to preserve it or keep it sure. somehow. What did you mean by that, please? Sure. Um, I can't answer it quickly, but I will try my best. But Mitchell Lama is a program that came out in the uh, four, 30, 40 years ago, which was low-cost financing for middle-income housing in the city of New York. So when you see lots of large buildings that look similar <laughs> built throughout the city, lots of times those are Mitchell Lama buildings. They were, um, it was a really large-scale production program. There's a couple hundred thousand units of Mitchell Lama in the city. Uh, it was a regulatory program, so there were restrictions on the incomes of people who lived in them. Those restrictions have largely expired because the program is old. And we spent a lot of time uh, working with Mitchell Lama owners and, that are for rental buildings and also with um, co-ops to try and keep them in an affordability program because they had, in fact, um, uh, were built under a specific affordability um, sort of term that expired and they were, the buildings were basically free to go to market. So when I'm talking about preserving, um, what I sort of mean is we work with the uh, owners in the case of a rental building and say, we would like to give you low-cost financing to renovate your building and put in capital repairs and make improvements, you know, new windows, new roofs. Um, and in exchange, we want you to keep the building affordable. And so we spent um, a lot of uh, energy in the last um, 10 years trying to keep Mitchell Lama type buildings from expiring out of the program. And let me take one last question. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh, I thought you were pointing to somebody else. <laughs> 
Thank you. It's a related question. Since the state was also heavily involved in the Mitchell-Lama program, mm -hmm. granted that the state budget is under its own constraints mm -hmm. currently, but is there any possibility of getting the state to become more involved? In, in, if you've lost so much funding from the federal government, and the state, the, the, the current administration in the state wants to uh, focus on the development of the economy, housing certainly is included in that. So, yeah, so we work really closely with the state. Um, we use, um, um, we use tax-exempt bonds to finance a lot of our construction, and we get those from the state. They sub-allocate them to us. We use 9% low-income housing tax credits. Those also come from the state, and, and, and we use them here in New York City. They also have a series of, um, they have a, um, they did a Medicaid uh, task force a couple years ago and freed up some funding from savings and Medicaid, and they're using that to finance um, housing, mostly for supportive housing, and some of those dollars are coming to the city. So we do, in fact, uh, work a lot with the state to finance uh, in the city, and they've been a great partner for us. And I think that's all I have time for. I would love to stay and answer more questions. I just have to run to another meeting. Um, but I thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Now, we have asked the committee chairs to uh, be very brief and to just announce their uh, upcoming meetings. And uh, I'm, we're hoping that some of you here will be interested enough to join with these committees. And uh, all you have to do is just RSVP the office and let them know that you're coming. The first person I like to call up is campaign finance reform, Rosemary. Uh, is the co-chair, Rosemary Shields. Uh, Rosemary? Uh, campaign finance reform. Our next uh, committee meeting is this Wednesday, the 15th, at 1 p.m. at the League office. Uh, lots of strategizing for campaign finance reform. Gladys, did you want to say something? Uh, the February meeting, we have to start. And February the 5th, who's, February the 6th, Barbara Bartoletti, our lobbyist in Albany, will be our star presenter. So that's, and she was part of the Moreland Commission. See, everybody else knows more about campaign finance than I do. But anyway, Wednesday, come one o'clock at the office. Thanks. Um, next, I'd like to call up Marianne Sullivan. She's the chair of the Environmental Action Committee. And they've been very active in uh, studying hydrofracking, and there's some other meetings uh, coming up that she's going to tell you about. Hi, our, our committee meeting is next Tuesday at the office um, at 12 o'clock. Um, so welcome. We'd love to have anybody who'd like to come. Next Thursday night um, at the Ethical Culture Center, the League of Women Voters of New York State and New York City is sponsoring an event at the Ethical Cultural Center on the potential of natural gas in New York State. This is a on research, new research on this, which will be very interesting from an investment point of view, as, and also as puts in question the need for New York State to frack or horizontal fracture, as they call it. And the governor has not approved this so far, but this, I hope, will put some more pressure on him not to, to preserve our water systems throughout the state and our air quality, much less our own personal health. And the th second meeting is going to be on January 30th, um, and it's, on the, it's a follow-up to our meeting in November, um, at lunch with the league on wind farms and Port Ambrose. Um, and please look for it on our website. And if anybody has any questions, please see me after the meeting. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mary, uh, a member of the league was in Albany yesterday and yes. demonstrated fra uh, about against hydrofracking. Could Betsy tell us what it was like to be up here? <coughs> I don't know that Beth is here. I haven't seen her. Is, were you there? I was there, yeah. Okay, well. Want to tell us about it? All right. Um, yes, uh, I assume most of you know Beth Kelly, and she is very involved with the anti-fracking movement, and she's a good friend of mine, and I go with her to 
a lot of the anti-fracking events, including the one yesterday in Albany, which got about 2,000 people. I think Cuomo was well aware of our presence, despite the fact that the police sort of kept us at quite a distance from any actual legislators, but Cuomo knew we were there. Great, thank you so much for doing that. And by the way, any of these meetings that you are interested in, if you forget the times, they're all on our website. And so all you have to do is visit our website to find out and then how to RSVP. Um, affordable housing, Carol. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad uh, we have such a great turnout for this very important issue. And our committee is working diligently now to prepare to come to some decisions so that the League of Women Voters, the City of New York, can be advocating for initiatives and strategies that the City Council and the Mayor can get behind. And we can push them to uh, preserve and build affordable housing. And to do that, we have a working committee, and our next meeting will be next Thursday morning at the League office. We usually meet on the second Thursday of the month, and we're probably going to have two meetings in February and two committee me meetings in March in order to prepare to present uh, our questions and get answers from the members as what they'd like the city to do. And then we're not lo looking for the federal and the state at this particular meeting, we're looking at only what we can do at the level of government of the city. And so I invite you all to come to that April meeting and to become members so that you can have input into that decision. Thanks, Carol. Um, we're gonna hear from uh, Fanny. Um, Connor, she's going to tell us, she's the chair of the Voter Service Committee, and uh, she's going to tell us about her upcoming meeting. And I just want, while she's coming up, to remind all of the committee chairs that we agreed at our last board meeting that you would um, give your, submit your written report in advance so that all the board members could read it ahead of time. And, so our board meetings could be a little bit shorter. So if you could do that, we'd greatly appreciate it. Fanny. Uh, good afternoon. Is it this afternoon, yeah? Afternoon. Uh, um, uh, I'm uh, the co-chair of voter service, and this year uh, we're taking on a study item and it's accessing, accessing uh, the ballot. How does, how does a person get on the ballot? What are the methods available? And is there some way that maybe we could change that a little bit? Uh, we're also going to be uh, talking about a voter registration drive for high school uh, seniors. So we invite all of you to come uh, because as you all know, uh, voter turnout in New York City is terrible. Uh, so we need everybody's participation. Thank you. Oh, sorry. 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 Uh, it, the meeting is uh, this Monday at uh, six o'clock at the league office. Are you serving anything? Yes, of course I'm serving. Of course. Fanny's always generous about providing refreshments. <laughs> so now, as you can see, our league is very active. What she talked about is a state study that we're in, involved with. So we hope that many of you will come out. Now we have a, a membership committee, and where's Evie? Did she disappear? There you are. <laughs> Evie's going, she's our um, membership committee co-chair, and she's going to tell you about how important it is to join our league and be a part of all the things you just heard about. Well, my participation is a surprise to me, but I'll go ahead <laughs> anyway. Um, it, it really, the League, has, uh, you can probably tell for the people that have come here for the first time, we're, we're involved in so many things, so many advocacy things, and yet through it all, we remain nonpartisan. That's part of our historic tradition. We have 
some committees that are working so hard, all for the public good, the most important being voter turnout, but you've heard about all the others. And key to this is to have enough people to really woman the man or woman these committees. And so we're, we're, membership committee is a very important part. We're not, we're not involved in so much advocacy, but we work very closely with those committees and we just try to get more and more people to join us. And once you join or once you get involved, start getting involved, you're really hooked. You get so, so tied up in these causes. And we meet um, every, every uh, I guess it's the second Tuesday of the month? Second Tuesday of every month. We just had a meeting earlier um, this week. We meet at one o'clock at the league office, and we're not only involved in membership, one of the things we're, we're talking about now is more outreach to individual communities, not just to Manhattan or the, uh, the, the areas, the parts of Brooklyn that are a subway stop from Manhattan, but to try to get out to communities throughout the city, and also to try to diversify more our membership. But the most important thing is just to get community outreaches, and we're just getting, we're really getting, in, we've been doing this for many years, but we're getting involved in ways to enhance this. And one of the things is we wanna pick communities, go out and run programs on issues that are of concern to the community. While, you know, we're all interested in, in some of the more global topics, to get thing in each community, what is it that, what issues are most important? Is it the way the schools are functioning or not doing as well as you want them to be? Is it the affordable housing availability? And this is really a very exciting idea where we want to first contact community leaders and find out from, so that we don't just go with gen, topics that interest us, that we go with topics that interest the local areas. And then in addition to that, um, we're, very, we're very much, and we work with all the other committees, with, especially with voter uh, participation, voter services. We go to areas trying to register voters and also at the same time trying to get them to join the league. So I really encourage you, if you have any interest in this, to sort of proselytize with us and get more people involved in our activities. Thank you. Myra is a very active member of our committee and uh, she wants to make an announcement about one of the, uh, several of, actually, of the sponsors as well as the um, uh, Union Local 237. What I wanted to do is say that uh, we have been underwritten to a degree by Verizon Corporation, and this meeting has been partially underwritten by them. Uh, the City Cafe on 43rd Street has provided a discount for the food, and of course this wonderful union has provided this room for us gratis with coffee and things. Um, and so I just wanted you to know who the good, generous people are in the community, and of course we're always set accepting other contributions for that. But I also wanted to say, and I believe the next membership meeting is February 4th, which happens to be the first uh, Tuesday in the month, so we've gone off course. But anyway, it's February 4th. We'd love to get anyone who's not on our list onto our list, anyone who's not a member, anyone wants to see me or ask questions, or Evie. Um, we'd love to answer any questions personally, and so uh, please feel free to join. We'd love to have you. Bye. Thanks, Myra. Adrian? Yeah, I don't know, Kathy's here too. I just, I couldn't <coughs> let the opportunity go. The, um, our election, uh, we, we monitor elections, and we monitor the Board of Elections and it's a religion with us. And we, and we have monitors at the Board of Elections meetings every week. Um, and Kathy is one of the, has been monitor. Kate Doran, who is our chair and our election specialist, is not here today. So in my emeritus category, I will, I will tell you this is a very important part. And what I would encourage you to do is there was a report issue last week by the Department of Investigation on the Board of Elections. Now. Um, Marjorie Shea and Barbara Zucker and Kathy and Kate, we've been going for years. We've been going longer than most of the commissioners or members. Of the <laughs> and we could have told them 10 years ago without spending the money, everything that they have in that report. We have been telling them for years and they didn't listen to us. 
and they don't seem to want to listen to the Department of Investigation. In fact, they've decided the Department of Investigation should be investigated. That's their response. Um, but it's a very important part of what the League does. And unless we have honest, competent elections in New York City, you're undermining the franchise. And that's what the League of Women Voters started out as. That's what we are. And we encourage you to follow what's happening at the Board of Elections. Um, Kate gives reports. We, we testify at city council hearings. We testify before the state. Uh, we're one of the goo-goos, the good government groups that tries to keep them honest. And, um, and Kate, Kate personally mentioned three of the things that are in that report. She has mentioned them at every single hearing. Kate and Kathy are both election coordinators on election day. They've known forever what it took the Department of Investigation to report. And so um, we're really into it. And I didn't think we should let the meeting end without, especially since we have this report now that's vindicated everything we've been saying for 25 years. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for that, Adrian. Yes, and uh, we'll be testifying, I believe, also at the Campaign Finance Board meeting that's coming up on the 22nd. So we are very active. Join us and um, join us for lunch. Oh, well, we already spoke. Jane is pointing back to the membership table, and she is our secretary and she's a very active member and so we hope you'll make a stop on your way to, to lunch. Uh, and I do want to recognize Sheila uh, Hosni, our hospitality <laughs> coordinator. She actually got up at four o'clock this morning and drove in from Philadelphia to put this spread out for you all. <laughs> okay. Okay.